Greetings everybody, Lars here. Today is going to be a different video than what you're used to getting because I am doing it from the futon in the dining room because I have to keep my leg up. I don't know if you can see the leg. Because if I don't, it'll fill with blood and it feels terrible even though I'm shot full of painkillers. But I didn't want that to stop me from getting you your first video. For Unit 5, Unit 5 is a big boy, and we're going to be doing something different. Uh, so far, you've been writing your programs uh, like they were recipes on your data, like you were baking a cake. This time, you're going to do something a little different. We're going to use object-oriented programming. And I'm not going to say simulate, but you're going to represent your data by creating what we call objects that are like what you're trying to represent in the real world and letting them deal with each other and affecting them in different ways. And we're going to go over it and take your time, read the slides, watch these videos, and you're going to be fine. Because none of the concepts we're going to look at are things that you haven't seen before. Data is data. What we call methods are really functions. You've seen functions before. Um, you've seen all this stuff before. So it's not going to be hard. So basically, what I usually do in this first video for Unit 5 is we're going to look at the slides and we're going to talk about object-oriented programming in general. And then I'm going to jump in and code something up. But what I code up is something that is not from your slides. It's something different. Because I think classes and the beginnings of object-oriented programming, I think it benefits you guys to see a lot of different examples. So I'm going to do an example of a bank account. I've been doing it the last couple of semesters I've given this class. So, and I like it. I think the bank account example works. So we're just going to real quick code that one up. I have no idea. I am sitting here balancing my laptop on one leg. So I do not know. Forgive me if things start to topple. And I don't know if I'm going to type fast, type slow, go fast, go slow. We're going to find out. Yes? Let's get right to it. Let's go... Oh, here. There's a picture of the wrapped up leg. Is it what well, you just saw it, basically? Take care of your legs, people. Achilles tendon is no fun. All right. What is object orientation? Basically, so far, we've been writing our programs like recipe, where the data would be our ingredients, and then we take our data and we do certain things to it following instructions. If you had a recipe, you would take the flour and the milk and the eggs and mix it all together and then put it in a bowl and stick it in the oven and cook it and bake a cake, blah, blah, blah. Well, when we do things to our data, it's like baking and stirring things around, and then we get the result we want. And that's how we start out when we start learning about computer programming. Okay? But there's another way of writing a computer program. There's actually a bunch of ways out there, but... In this class, we're only going to concern ourselves with imperative, which is like dealing with a recipe and object orientation. When you write a program that deals with object orientation, what you're doing is <clears throat> you're representing your data in a way where you bunch together the data and the things you can do with that data. And the example I always use is like a bicycle. What if I want to model a bicycle in a computer program? Well, then I want something that has a color. It has a frame. It has two wheels. It has handlebars. Um, but along with all that data, I also want a list of the things I can do with it. You can ride it. You can stop it. You can you know, paint it. You can do all of those different things. It makes sense if you have an object in the real world that when you look at it, you're not just looking at its attributes, and that's what we we'll call it at the end of the day, the attributes of an item, its color, its size, its weight, things along those lines, what it, what it can do, what it looks like. But you also want to codify its behaviors, what it can do and, and what you have it do in the real world. And then if you can represent a lot of these different objects, you can let them interact together and discover things that you wouldn't be able to discover if you just, you know, did an imperative setup. And basically, but when you do an imperative setup, basically you're setting up your data. And then what you do with that data is implied in the logic that you code. 
with object orientation, it's almost like we set up these blueprints and we say, we have this certain kind of object and this is what you can do with it. And you're going to see that in a minute when we create our first class. Because what we do, and, and this slide just shows that we look at different systems. Uh, when I used to teach for an enrichment school, at the end of the day, they would either do a zoo or a solar system. So I always like solar systems because the planets, you know, they're very similar, but they have different attributes. Like Jupiter is very large. It has different colors. The Earth is solid as opposed to gaseous, and it has different attributes and things along those lines. So objects can be have a lot of things in common, but they also can have things that are different. Um, when we create objects, what we want to do first is create a blueprint. And that blueprint is what we're going to use to create our object. And then as we give it data, we're going to make it its own unique thing. But at first, like human beings, what do human beings have in common? Most of us have two arms, two legs, um, 10 digits. We can speak, blah, blah, blah. But we're all individuals and we're all different because we all have different hair color. We all uh, speak differently things along those lines. So they're the things that make us the same and the things that make us individuals. The things that make us the same are usually codified and put together in the class. So we have a blueprint for that certain thing and it gets all into representation and categorization. We won't go that deep into it. But then when you start filling out the attributes and the data, then things start getting individual and then your object becomes its own thing. Again, you'll see when we start getting into it. I always liken it to a blueprint for a boat where I could have a blueprint for a boat like I have right there, but I can create a whole bunch of different kind of boats by just looking at that one blueprint. Okay. And that at the end of the day is what we're going to do when we look at the first part of object oriented programming, which is a class. And like everything we do, it's going to make a lot more sense after you see me code one up and we start using it, then you'll be like, Oh, okay. Now I kind of get it. Um, in this first example, I might talk about attributes and behaviors and all of that stuff. I code up a die so that you can see a dice class in action. And it's only one die. I shouldn't say dice. It's a die. And so you can see it be used and you can learn about constructors and getters and setters and all that. But I don't want to do that for the video. I want you to see as many examples as you can. So what I usually do is I will code up. Uh, I got to use one hand on that trackpad because they don't have my mouse because I am trying to balance this on my leg. All right, we're going to find out now whether I'm going to be able to type. I think I'll be okay. All right, I am going to create a class for a bank account. So what's the first thing I'm going to do? I'm going to type the keyword class. And then very simply, I'm just going to call it account. Then I'm going to go colon and I'm going to hit enter. Look at us go. Now, when I create a blueprint or a class, what's the first thing that I want to do. I want to create the method or the function. Remember, when we have functions inside of classes, we call them methods. And as I say all over the place, I have no idea why. But that terminology was used in the 80s and people have stuck with it. So if you have a function inside of a class, it's called a method. So I will call it a method because you are going to hear it going forward when you deal with other people and other programming languages. So we'll, we're just going to call it a method too. When you have a class, the most important method in that class is the one that runs when you create an object using the class or the blueprint. And that method is always called a constructor. Okay. In Python, the name of constructors is two underscores. Python programmers call them dunders. And then the word init, which pretty much stands for initialize. You know what? I almost forgot. I am defining a method, which is just a function. So make sure you have DEF in front of it. Okay. Then I am going to create a parameter list. Uh, first thing I'm going to put in is the word self. And I will explain that in a moment. Um, the second thing I'm going to put in is I'm going to put in the variable amount. Because when I create my account, I'm going to give it a starting balance. Okay, so what am I going to do in this function? First thing I'm going to do, I think, is I'm going to print. You have a new account. Nice. 
And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to access a new variable that I create called self.balance. I'm going to make it equal to amount. And that's it. That's my constructor. Now, I'll explain it now. You'll understand a little bit more when we get moving. But self is just a simple variable term so that the class can refer to itself. As I am defining this class, this blueprint, I don't know what the actual object is going to be called. That's going to be the actual object's variable name. But if I want this object to be able to refer to itself during the process of building the blueprint, I use the term self. And you'll see when we create our first bank account and actually use it, what goes into self is really the variable name. Now, you don't put it in when you call it. It's kind of understood. It's done implicitly. But that's what the self is there for. And you'll see how I have self.balance for my what's called instance variable. Um, I'll explain that later too. But you'll see that this variable is just for this one object that's been created. It's not shared among all the other objects. It's just for this particular object. And you'll see what I mean in a second. So I've created my constructor. What's the next thing I want to do? The next thing I think I'm going to do is I am going to create a getter. Now, most classes, when they have data items, they have things called getters and setters. What these are are methods that allow us to access the data item, the getters, and also alter them or change them if need be. And these are usually called the setters. Now, in our particular example, we don't need setters because after I write this getter, I'm going to create two new methods for my bank account. One's going to be called deposit and the other is going to be called withdrawal. So those are the two ways I'm going to affect my variable. I don't really need a setter, so I'm not going to create one in this instance. But usually it's good programming practice to create getters and setters for all of your instance variables. I'm not going to bother. Now I'm going to say self because we always start out with self when we write a method inside of a class. And... I don't need anything else, so I don't need that comma. And all I'm going to do is return self.balance. Because the, that's all I want to do, is I want to return the balance so that it can be printed or whatever. When I call that, I'll always set it equal to a variable, or I'll print it because it's fruitful. But that's basically all I'm going to do, is I'm going to report out that particular variable. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is create a method called deposit and that will be self and that will be amount not Amy amount and what this is going to do is this is going to make self dot balance plus equal to amount so I'm going to add amount to deposit now if I were a professional programmer and I were doing this for real I would check to make sure it's not zero because then I wouldn't do anything. I would check to make sure it wasn't negative because then I would say don't don't deposit a negative. You withdraw, blah, blah, blah. I would do all the error checking. For our purposes, I'm not going to do any of that stuff. I'm just going to say self.balance and I'm going to and I'm going to add the amount that I'm depositing to the balance. All right. So technically, we're done with that. Now, I am going to do one little thing when I do our withdrawal method. And when I do our withdrawal method, I'm going to do one simple check. And that simple check is I'm going to say if amount is greater than self.balance. Well, what does that mean? If amount is greater than self.balance, what does that mean? Well, that means I'm trying to withdraw too much money. So what do I want to do then? I want to print insufficient funds okay else I'll go ahead and do what I originally was going to do and I will say self dot balance minus equals amount and I will withdraw that amount from the account okay now that's it that's your first class that is a bank account class that when I started up, 
it creates a variable called balance and it's set to an amount that I give it and it says you have a new account. Then I have three methods I can use. I can say get balance and it'll give me the balance of the account or I can make a deposit or I can make a withdrawal. Now, you are not going to understand this. I'm going to save right there until I start using it. So let's go. I'm going to create a bank account called A. <laughs> not a very creative variable name. You will have to forgive me. And I will call it with the class name. And I will set it up with $500. Then I will create a bank account called B. And I will make that with $300. Then I will print A get balance. So I will print A. And then I will print B dot ah. get balance. Okay, this balancing on my leg is working. Oh, working a little bit. I don't know. We'll see what happens when I produce the thing and I have to do all the close-ups and the blah blah blah. Alright. So now I save this and I run it. Let's see what we get. Okay, yay. It actually runs. So we didn't get any errors, which is good and bad because I kind of like errors because then you learn stuff when you see the errors. All right. A equals account 500. You have a new account. Great. That's what it did when it initialized. I don't print the balance. I just make it equal to. So then I create a second account. B, account with 300. Yay, you have a new account. So then what do I do next? I print A, get balance, and then I print B, get balance. So for the first one, A, I print 500, and that's what I have for a balance. Then the second one, I print 300. All right, I'm in pretty good shape here. Now, let's do more with our program. Uh, oh, we're going to run into this problem now. The programs that we write are going to be longer than the screen. So we're going to have to go up and down, up and down, up and down, because we are getting too complex. We're too complicated now. We already know Python. All right, let's take my first account and make a deposit. I am going to deposit an extra 500 bucks in that account. Look at me go. Now for B, I am going to withdraw, uh, let's say 200. I'm not going to make a boo-boo yet. And then, let's see how I can do this. Not what I wanted to do. Ay, ay, ay. All right, hold it. Yay, control copy. Let's see if it works. Look at that. All right, so I've got a balance. It's 500 and 300, and it'll print again because I didn't comment anything out. Then I make a deposit of 500 to A, so that's going to bounce that up to 1,000. Then I make a withdrawal from B of 200, so that ought to jack that down to 100. And I print them again, so we're going to find out. So let's run that and see what we get. All right, see, our program is working. This is really good. We're going to test one more thing. Um, I'm going to test the functionality of my withdrawal by saying B, withdrawal, 200. Now, I, have, I am asking the B account for 200 bucks when only $100 are in there. So, let's find out what, well, I know what that's going to tell me, hopefully. All right, let's find out. All right, it does, insufficient funds. And then I print it, and I can see there's still 100 in there. Okay? So now, if I wanted to, I could say b.deposit. 300 B dot withdrawal 200 and now it should work because I got the funds to cover it. And that's what happens. Okay? I add 300 which gives me 400. I withdraw 200, which leaves me 200 left, and that's what's printed out right there. Okay? So that's the beginning of object-oriented programming. As you can see, I created a blueprint for a bank account, savings account, let's say, 
and I created a function, real quick two-line function that runs when it's created. And then I created three other functions that we can use when we use it. But then here, I use my class, okay? I instantiate the class and get an actual object, and it's held in the variable A, or it's pointed to, actually, by the variable A. So A, I have a bank account. That bank account's balance is 500. Then I create a new one called B. And then by, you know, using the dot and then method call on my different variables, I can call and do things with my different objects. You can see I get the balance for both here. Here I make a deposit to A, but then a withdrawal for B. So I'm creating them as, as two separate objects. I created one blueprint, but I have two different objects I'm working with here. Okay. And then I pretty much start using B down here when I test withdrawal and I do some other things. But as always, I'm going to take this code and I'm going to put it on the web for you to play around with and for you to use. And please take this one and play around with it. You know, switch that conditional around for withdrawal. Play around with different names. If you want, you can alter your methods so that with deposit and withdrawal, you can print out what you're depositing and what you're withdrawing. Because I could see if I were to give this for a homework assignment, I could see saying to somebody, when you make a deposit, tell me what you're depositing and what the new balance is after you made the deposit. Okay? So I could see that happening all the time, all right? So that's the beginning of classes. And you're going to see in the next video we do over the next couple of days, when I start talking about inheritance and polymorphism, I'm going to do a whole new class with animals. So you'll get to see that class run too. So you'll get the dice class. you got that simple student account class in the Zell book. You've got this class now for a bank account. You'll see the class coming up for animals and stuff like that. So I want you to see a lot of examples of classes and see what they do. I think the Zell book does a decent job of explaining what it is, but I want to I want to hit you from all possible angles so that you can see this stuff work and you can see this stuff run, okay? Um, I am actually recording this Monday night, so I am only three days post-op. But uh, right now, you're working on Unit 4 stuff. So as far as announcements are concerned, uh, I guess you're probably going to see this video before your proposal is due for the final project. So make sure you're working with your group mates. Make sure you're good on that. You know what that is. Don't, you know, just throw that together quick. It's tough for you guys, though, because I know this is summer and everything's truncated. So you'd be surprised. Those extra four weeks that a regular semester has, they come in handy. Because this course is, you know, pretty packed up. I want to introduce you to a lot of things. Um, this unit's a lot longer than most regular units. Think unit three with this. This is a big unit. So you're going to have 18, 19 days with it. But it's challenging. And it's a new way to think. And you've got to put the time in. So just like I said with unit three, procrastinators will get hammered. Just believe me. The procrastinators got hammered in unit three. Okay, A lot of people went from A's to B's in Unit 3, and it's not because they're not programming. It's because they're not putting in the time. Okay, Programming is time on task. End of story. I've been doing it a long time. I've been teaching it a long time. If you put in the time, you will get it. You will be successful. All right? Know that. There's no – people aren't born bad programmers or born good programmers. That's crap. It's a lot of crap. Time on task. You study this stuff, you work with this stuff, you're going to get it. Trust me. All right? I know. I've been doing this a while. All right. So I'm going to get out of here because i got to pop another pain pill. <laughs> i got to make some chicken so I can eat, so I can get healthy, so I can get up and run and break something else in four months. All right? So you be good, and I will be, again, like I try to do with you guys in the summertime, I'm going to front load your resources. So to be honest, I'm hoping to do a... Unit 5 video every night for the next three nights. So this is number one. Hopefully tomorrow night I'll be getting you your video on inheritance and polymorphism. And then the next video after that, we get to do the fun stuff. We get to do class variables. We get to do deconstructors where you set up a method that runs where you delete an object or explode an object. Um, there's some neat stuff going on with the little nicky knack stuff. And then, you know, I want to get you all the videos and get you all the stuff. So that you're front loaded and then you can spend the next two and a half weeks working on this stuff and getting it going, all right? So hopefully you did good on Unit 4. I know you're not going to see this.
probably not going to see this video until Wednesday or Thursday. So hopefully Unit 4 worked out and everything is cool. And uh, you have a good night. I'll talk to you soon. All right, I'm out of here. Bye-bye.